by Sueza with us, uh, our head of global head of market intelligence, who will be available for any questions afterwards. And Johan Bordes has joined us, our head of uh, services and support globally, uh, and they'll both assist me as needed in this presentation. So. Let's just give you a, a reflect on the decade um, as we as we now cadence into the second decade of uh, of operations for for Embraer. What stands out to me is we've broken through 1,200 uh, e-jets that have delivered. Um, of course, the first e-jet entered into service in 2004. Uh, we delivered aircraft number 1,200 to Azul late last year, in the fourth quarter of last year. Um, we've celebrate, we celebrated a decade of 190 operations. We've already celebrated a decade of 170. We've already celebrated a decade of 175. We've now celebrated the 190. And this year, we'll celebrate a decade of 195 operations. We continue to add new customers around the world, which is a key part of our philosophy at Embraer and broadening our franchise footprint. Uh, we believe that the key to our sustainability is to have as wide an operator base as is possible. Uh, your incumbency with a broad operator base uh, is an enormous resource for any airframe or indeed power plant OEM in the world. And it's something that Embraer is very focused on. It also feeds uh, very deeply into robust uh, residual values of aircraft. And that's why today, when we talk to the leading appraisers around the world, uh, the E-Jets are in the same category as uh, the new 777s, the 787s, the A320s, uh, 73 uh, next, uh, Maxes. So we're perceived as investment grade, and that comes from having a broad operator base uh, and sustainability. Uh, of lease rates and purchase prices in the marketplace. So my team spends a lot of time in opening up new customers and opening up uh, nine operators just in the, in the last 12 months is something that uh, we spend a lot of time uh, working on. Just to uh, uh, reflect on our success of, of uh, the E2, um, I'm not sure if Louise uh, referenced this earlier on, but last year, we, it was last year, right? Uh, we were awarded the Crystal uh, Cabin Award uh, in Frankfurt for the new interior on the E2. And those of you that were in Singapore last week at the air show would have seen the most updated interior of the E2 with our new uh, first class seats. And almost uniformly, um, it's been referred to as a wide body field in, uh, in a smaller aircraft. I say smaller aircraft, not a regional jet because in my opinion, certainly the 190 and 95 are not regional jets. These are aircraft that are being operated very comfortably, again, complementing larger narrow bodies, but operating comfortably in network carriers. Uh, so, of course, uh, as we look now, the important focus in, over the course of the next few years is the on-time entry into service, the on-schedule and on-time entry into service of the 190. Uh, E2, which will enter into service in the first half of 2018. The 195 E2, which will enter into service 12 months later, in the first half of 2019. And the 175 E2, the smallest member of the family, will enter into service in the first half of 2020. We will reveal the 190 tomorrow. And by the way, can I just say, on a personal note, it's magnificent. Uh, it's a very different look and feel of an airplane than the current, uh, current E-Jets, I think you'll all be uh, uh, quite surprised with what you see, pleasantly surprised with what you see. So Louise is uh, focusing on ensuring that the first flight of the 190 E2 happens on schedule uh, in the second half of this year. So broadly, and uh, the whole program is very pleased, and Fernando who heads up our E2 program is very pleased that they have not changed this schedule from when they launched the program a number of years ago. So Embraer continues to be to be on time. And that's a reflection, I think. Why is that? Why do we have a different experience than perhaps other OEMs? It's because the tacit knowledge we have of delivering uh, new aircraft programs is now 
uh, very sophisticated at Embraer. And I would argue that the E2 is very close in, in most respects uh, to a clean sheet design. New wings, new landing gear, uh, new empennage, new systems, new, uh, new uh, engines, of course. Um, so this is an enormous program for Embraer. And as Louise shared with you this morning, we didn't, this is not one wing that we've stretched over three platforms, it's actually three wings. So the concept of right sizing that Embraer talks about, we have applied it more than any other OEM in the world to our airframes. So every airframe has a right sized um, uh, wings for its mission and operation. The analog of success for an airframe OEM is simple. Uh, you gotta match how many aircraft you're selling with the fact that you maintain your profitability. Now you can follow our profitability, we're a public company quoted on the New York Stock Exchange and the Bovespa uh, Exchange in Sao Paulo. So you can follow the sustainability of our, of our profitability. So we are a sustainably profitable organization, um, but we're delivering a lot of aircraft. We're selling a lot of aircraft, but frankly delivering aircraft is more important than selling aircraft because that's when the bulk of the revenue shows up. Uh, but certainly, this gives us incumbency, and this is one of the major uh, advantages that Embraer feeds on. And I always, when I see this chart, um, it reminds me to think about uh, back in the late 90s when Embraer considered what they were doing uh, from a product development perspective and when they launched the original E-Jets into operation. And this was a time when the organization didn't particularly have the level of relationships with the global airline base that they have today. Remember, at that time, let's say we were operating our 145s, our 140s, 135s, 145s principally, and principally in uh, Northern Europe, and to a lesser extent in Western continental Europe. And for Embraer to make the uh, shift, strategic shift in their product positioning from the regional jet, the 50-seater regional jet, to a much larger aircraft was a very I would argue bold and brave move. Uh, boldness is one of our cultural values at Embraer and that was exemplified in that move back then. What we're doing now with the E2, uh, my sales force and my, uh, the marketing team and myself, I would argue we should have a much easier job than what Embraer had back here when the first uh, 170 entered into service. Why? Because we've got 70 customers in 50 countries. And that is an enormous tailwind uh, of momentum that Embraer enjoys today, and certainly uh, an asset that we plan to monetize over the course of the next few years. This is, uh, this is a focus of Embraer, adding new operators. Um, I am indifferent whether our new operators join us by flying new E-Jets or aircraft they have received pre-owned from another airline or from a leasing company. I am razor focused on adding new operators in new jurisdictions. And that's a key part of our mantra now across, uh, across the Embraer group. So very pleased not only with the quality of the airlines uh, that have come on board as new operators for different aircraft types, but certainly the spread of the operators. Um, just to mention uh, Delta Airlines, I'm going to uh, reference a little later in the deck uh, the quantum of aircraft that we predict the 100 seaters in North America. Uh, not the smaller 175 size platform, but the larger 100 seaters. So Delta's move uh, to take 19 aircraft uh, from BCC and put them into operation in the main line uh, is a, can only be recognized as a seismic shift in the um, perception of the North American network carriers in how they will deploy uh, smaller uh, aircraft uh, at the mainline level. And of course, this is all about right sizing. This is about the new metrics of success uh, that Embraer has been presenting to the marketplace uh, over the course of the last 12 months. It's about chasing profitability. It's not about chasing market share. It's about deploying the right sized asset so you, you fit the, uh, the trip cost to match the yield you can get off the aircraft and ensure that you have profitability. So we believe that this move by Delta Airlines uh, could, ten could potentially be a point of inflection for the 100 120 seat type platform in the North American market as we go forward here in the next couple of years. But again, when we think about Austrian 
airlines introducing in January of this year the 195 platform into their system. Uh, so again, we, we're starting to get proliferation of the e-jets right across the Lufthansa group, which is very important to us. And of course, opening up new operators in China, Colorful Guizhou took uh, delivery of two aircraft in December. Uh, this is a startup in China and already commenced revenue generating service uh, in December of, uh, of last year. So an amazing feat. Um, so good spread, uh, plenty of new operators. And uh, my hope and expectation is that we will continue to add uh, more operators again this year, next year, and the year after. We certainly have momentum on that front. So our sales last year were uh, 176 uh, aircraft. And again, sales, we're talking about new aircraft here, of course. Uh, again, going into a plethora of airlines right around the world. Uh, we have um, quite a number of transactions, some repeat orders, some orders from new customers. So again, this is, uh, this is feeding the, the backlog in a very sustainable way. And, and that's an important point. We're feeding the backlog in a sustainable way with, uh, with um, uh, robust counterpart credits. And that's very important to us that we have credibility uh, in, in our backlog as we continue to grow in the marketplace uh, appreciates that. I mentioned earlier 70 airlines in 50 countries. This looks very different to the profile that we had with the, the 145s, which was concentrated quite a bit in North America and to a lesser extent here, uh, Western continental Europe, obviously some operators in Africa and, and uh, South America. But here we've had a very different program. We want to be on every continent. Uh, and we're chasing the thought leaders. We're chasing the, um, the big brands. Uh, around the world. Uh, so when you think about the bigger brands in Europe, Air France, KLM, Lufthansa, British Airways, Lock Polish, Alitalia, uh, North America, American Delta, United, Alaska, JetBlue. So we're chasing the brands that customers uh, are aware of. And, uh, and again, this feeds to residual value and it helps us, frankly, when we're selling aircraft to new jurisdictions as we continue to want to open new jurisdictions. We think about market share. Uh, this, this is an important, uh, an important uh, part of our business. It's, again, what gives the e-jets uh, their robust residual values. Well, the important uh, slide for me, I guess, is not because it's the highest, uh, the higher of the two percentages, but it's deliveries that count. So when it comes to deliveries, we have 60% uh, market share. Uh, we have a very competitive marketplace. Uh, ours is truly uh, an oligopoly, not a duopoly, uh, like our, our friends in uh, Toulouse and Seattle enjoy. So we have, we have many uh, incumbents and insurgents uh, that uh, we compete with on a daily basis. So um, it is a very competitive marketplace, but at the end of the day, uh, Embraer is competing with what I believe um, is an aircraft that's best positioned to address the demands of the airlines. Uh, I'm not saying our aircraft is the cheapest to buy, but it is the best positioned. And that's why airlines, when they're procuring uh, these commercial jets, they're requiring them for 20, 25 years of operation. Um, and the analog of success is very simple, it's binary. We've got over 50% market share of sales, we've got over 50% uh, of the deliveries, and it is a strategic imperative for our chief executive, Paulo Cesar Silva, that we maintain uh, these percentages as we go forward. Just want to bring your attention, I know we have a lot of journalists from the North American market, um, so I just want to highlight uh, our successes uh, in, in our particular market just in the, uh, in the course of the last couple of years. So over 83% penetration uh, in this market, in our space, over the, over the uh, last couple of years which again speaks to uh, these airlines are, have been operating the Embraer equipment for a very long time in, in, uh, in these three cases, uh, Alaska Notch on the 145, but these were big operators on the 145. I always take the opportunity in these presentations to highlight that one of our, our secret sources, one of our strategies, um, and we're happy to share this, um, is to spend a lot of time, spend a lot of money, a lot of our resources in our after-sales uh, 
uh, support organization. And we like to share that with people because that's very difficult to replicate. It, it can take decades to build up a robust after-sales support. And that's why, thanks to Johan, just had to step out, but that's why Johan and uh, under Luis's leadership, we enjoy a global dispatch reliability uh, that's over 99.3% in the world. That doesn't happen by accident. That happens because we're spending a lot of time. So when you're going back to major airlines like this that have had uh, relationships with us, in some cases going back 20, 30 plus years, uh, they know that when we, uh, when we make promises, uh, we deliver on our promises on a consistent basis. But as we look forward, um, you know, we're, you're always very interested in running the ruler over what the wallet size is uh, for our size equipment. So specifically, uh, 6,350 units over the course of the next 20 years. So there you go, that's about $300 billion uh, of business uh, in today's dollars. Um, that's, that's the sort of market which accounts for just over 20% uh, of the new aircraft that will be sold. I appreciate that uh, in the, uh, the larger uh, narrow body size, uh, it's a significantly bigger number. Uh, but it is not our strategy to compete with Boeing and Airbus. Um, our strategy is to address the market that's below uh, Boeing and Airbus. Uh, not just to address that market, but I want to maintain a market leading position in the space that we're going after. And we designed the E1 and of course now the E2 to be dominant in, uh, in, in that space. The geographical spread. Um, 50% between North America and continental Europe. A lot more action going on, certainly in Asia, uh, Pacific, and China. Uh, one in four aircraft for us will be delivered in that region. Um, we were, Paulo Cesar, um, Silva, and I were at the Singapore Air Show last week. Uh, there's, there is no doubt that the uh, compound annual growth that they're experiencing uh, in demand for passenger travel as a direct result of their GDP growth um, it's just extraordinary over there. So we're going to see, uh, we'll continue to see amazing growth in this area. Uh, China will continue to have double digit growth from our perspective. We have, uh, just to mention China, we have over 80% market share in China of everything below 130 seats. And we continue to uh, focus a lot of our resources through uh, a significant operation that we have uh, in Beijing, in servicing the existing customer base in China, and indeed growing that uh, customer base as identified by the growth of, uh, let's say, Colorful Guizhou just joining us last year. Um, we continue to sell E1s and indeed E2s. We, we have a, a, uh, an order on the books from the Hainan Group for Tianjin under Hainan, uh, where they order 20 E1s and 20 E2s. So they have firmed up all the 20 E1s and the first two of the 20 E2s. And uh, we expect to see continuation and firming up the balance of, of that order uh, through the Chinese system as, as it plays out. So a very important market for us here. Uh, it's clear that our, our brand recognition, our penetration, our, our dominance in North America and continental Europe, and I guess in Latin America is very strong. Uh, so we're spending a lot of time now with our, our marketing team under, um, under, under our, our team here and our team uh, in the region to grow our presence in Asia Pacific, CIS, and of course the Middle East. Why are people going to continue to buy e-jets? Well, there's a multitude of reasons. We've, we've sort of broken them out. Certainly, uh, you're seeing not just in North America, but in continental Europe and indeed other places, uh, a lot of the market is upgaging from 50-seaters. Um, that just be that's a function of a number, a number of things. Uh, oil probably plays a little part in it. Uh, the demand for uh, commercial pilots around the world plays a demand in it. Uh, the compound annual growth of passenger demand around the world matched with the infrastructure availability, i.e. aircraft and runways to land on, plays a role in it. So we're seeing a natural upgaging from 50-seaters to larger gauge equipment. And that will support a lot of our sales on the 175 platform as we go forward. Um, in fact, I was saying to Rodrigo yesterday, we're seeing some examples of a, a double stretch, right, Rodrigo, where people are, in some cases, jumping past the 175 and 
and uh, getting into the 190 platform. But we see a lot of activity here. Right sizing, well, that's a concept that uh, Rodrigo and his team have been spending a lot of time making those intellectual arguments with airlines, um, almost from a, a granular bottoms up basis, where we show to airlines that if you deploy the right size aircraft uh, to either stimulate traffic uh, or indeed if you're traveling with larger and narrow bodies with lower load factors to right size uh, the aircraft, you'll not only of course have a lower trip cost as I mentioned earlier, but you should have a much higher uh, load factor and by definition you should be able to manufacture a better yield, which all things being equal will, uh, will will uh, generate a significantly higher profit for you. Increasingly, we are seeing airlines adopt that philosophy. The whole idea of being in a single fleet type was a mantra that was adopted many years ago uh, by a number of airlines, but we're now seeing a very strong cadence away from that philosophy uh, in recent years. And airlines, whilst they don't want to operate uh, four or five fleet types, uh, let's say in the narrow body and smaller sector, but the concept of, uh, the concept of operating a couple of fleet types is certainly something that's, uh, that is attractive to airlines, and we're making a lot of progress on that front. The turboprop replacement, I would argue that possibly this number might be a little on the low side. When we look at the performance capabilities of the 175E2, that crossover point, that break-even crossover point, has moved to the left closer to, I'm going to guess, maybe 200, 225 nautical miles. So we're going to see a lot of customers uh, in parts of the world where today, or let's say in the last 10 or 15 years, the turboprop was the preferred way to travel because of either A, uh, the economics that those operators could pass on to customers, or B, because of the runway capabilities. Well, as the world gets wealthier in the emerging markets, and as the infrastructure continues to be developed, i.e. airports and runways, we think a lot of the turboprops, the current turboprops, that current technology uh, may well be addressed for airlines that are operating longer than 200 or 250 nautical miles. The LCCs. It's fair to say our penetration of the LCCs um, hasn't been uh, as robust as what we might have liked. However, with the capabilities now of the E2 platform, and particularly the 190 and 195, uh, the economics of those aircraft, I believe, would be very attractive now to uh, the demands for the LCCs. Why is that? I am not advocating or proposing that the LCCs, will, where they were operating the 1820s, <coughs> where they're doing that today, they're going to replace it with the 195. So I'm not advocating that. But what I am seeing are trends where, as these LCCs want to grow their operations, they're now looking at joining city pairs that are outside those larger cosmopolitan areas that they are, in some cases, very successfully operating with 73s or 8320s. But if you go to a secondary city, or a smaller cosmopolitan area, or you want to join two smaller cosmopolitan areas, which the LCCs, as they want to grow, will want to morph into broadening their own franchise footprint, you can only serve those smaller uh, city pairs with smaller gauged equipment. You can only do it profitably, I should say, with smaller gauged equipment. And that's why we think over the course of the next 5, 10, 15 years, there will be an enormous amount of growth from those LCC franchises broadening uh, their own network and joining city pairs that today would not be city pairs that they would think about in their, in let's say, the traditional LCC mindset. We want to be there to address that, particularly with our 190 and indeed our 195. Uh, we mentioned uh, China and Brazil, regional aviation alone in those two markets. Uh, I would probably add uh, I would probably add um, Brazil into that, uh, excuse me, uh, India into that as well, uh, would probably be a, a fair representation. Um, China continues to be robust. Brazil, of course, as you are aware, uh, is, it's in a moment of, of pullback uh, in the current climate. But certainly, as sure as night follows day, 
uh, Brazil will emerge from the uh, from the current slowdown that it's experiencing uh, as it has and has other jurisdictions in the past and we want to be there to serve it uh, with with the e-jets China we've already got very strong penetration and in India we have penetration and we plan to grow it with more operators uh, in the coming years and finally well we mentioned earlier on the hundred seater in uh, in the US market so I'm very bullish on the opportunities to address that wallet size of 6,350 aircraft. I would like to, my CEO has given us, the, uh, given the whole team, the mandate of protecting our market share. Um, we believe we've got the right aircraft uh, for the passengers. We believe we do because we've listened to the passengers and our airline customers and our lessor customers. Uh, we didn't design the aircraft and try, and try to sell it to them. We decided to do it the other way around. We listened to them, we asked them, uh, Luis Carlos mentioned our advisory board and we're having the final uh, advisory board uh, this afternoon here in San Jose but we've had disciplined advisory boards from before we launched this listening to our airline customers and the lessor customers. Lessors will play a significant role in supporting the e-jets as we go forward. We already have uh, three lessors on the program. Aircap, one of the largest if not the largest leasing company in the world. It's between them and GCAS I guess. Air Castle, publicly quoted on the New York Stock Exchange, and ICBC, uh, a wholly owned subsidiary of the largest financial institution group in the world. Um, so we've got robust lessors on board, um, and they will help us to penetrate the market, piggybacking perhaps off their customers, and uh, we can enjoy their sales force supporting us and their incumbency with customers. Uh, that's it. I mean, uh, so <laughs> let's roll. This is, guys. You know, j just for a moment before I take questions, this is a hugely emotional day. Um, tomorrow will be for everybody in, in Embraer, and I, I kind of would like for you all to take that away and get the feeling for what we're doing here. Uh, we certainly have momentum at Embraer. We've enjoyed a lot of successes. We have a lot of customers around the world. Uh, but there's the one thing you get from Embraer is there's no arrogance down here. Absolutely, we're, it's, it's uh, the opposite of our DNA. Um, we are here to serve our customers. That's one of our values. Uh, we all wear our values, right? Uh, we are here to serve our customers, and it's our people that make us fly. So it's the guys uh, that are in the field listening to the customers uh, and addressing what we believe that their needs will be as they tell us. Uh, continue to invest and improve the existing platforms is very important. That's in our DNA. Uh, we've, you saw what we did with the 175 a few years ago, improving the fuel burn by over 6%. And of course, that yielded hundreds of sales of the 175s in North America. We've also done, continue to do aerodynamic uh, improvement right across the fleet. So it's our DNA to want to keep uh, improving the operation. It's in our DNA to keep improving the aircraft. Uh, but tomorrow is a, a milestone. Uh, the E-Jets will be, let's say, at least 50% of our revenues at Embraer, I'm sure, um, going forward. So it's a very important day, and I hope, uh, I hope you enjoy tomorrow at that level as well as the intellectual level. So with that, questions.